Anti-American activity of Communist Party membership during the 1930s. Chambers later revised this charge to include espionage, alleging that Hiss, as a State Department official, had passed vital government documents to the Russians. This began a bizarre case, which culminated in Hiss's conviction on two counts of perjury and Richard Nixon's meteoric rise to national prominence. Fred J. Cook, crime reporter and author for three decades, discusses his research into the Hiss case, which produced a book called The Unfinished Story of Alter Hiss. James G. Crowley, a reporter for the Boston Globe, tells of his meeting with Richard Nixon during the events of the winter of 1948. When I first got into the Hiss case, I would say most reluctantly, in 1957. Uh, like a lot of uh, Americans, I think the majority of Americans at the time, I had always considered Hiss to be Gilly. I think that that uh, stemmed from the fact that Whittaker Chambers had produced documents. There was a, probably a deeper feeling in the liberal community against Hiss almost than there was in the, in the radical right community because this was the guy who betrayed everything that we really believed in. And uh, many liberals, uh, like myself, when they saw the documents, they became convinced and they shut their minds and that was it. And I would have shut my mind too if I hadn't been prodded to really go and look at the basic evidence. I didn't uh, want to do the Hiss case at all, but Kerry McWilliams at The Nation, who had seen, I had written some pieces for The Nation before, and he'd seen some of my other articles, asked me to look at the Hiss case, and I said, no, Kerry, I don't want any part of it. I have no desire to get into this at all. I think the guy is guilty, and that's it. We came back a third time, and he said, will you do this for me? He said, will you take a look at the evidence? If you don't like it, you can walk away from it and say, no, I want no part of it. So then I began to look at the, uh, at the hard evidence of his case, at the House on american Activities Committee hearings and the court record and Chambers' own book, uh, Witness. And, of course, I, the more I looked at it, the more disturbed I became. Uh, the ob one of the first obvious things that hit everyone as the Chambers had testified under, under oath any number of times that uh, espionage had never been involved in his relations with Hiss. And then after he was sued for libel by Hiss, uh, suddenly he produces the documents and the whole story changes and espionage had been involved in the case all the time. He said originally that he was out of the Communist Party in December of 1937 and then you find that the documents that he produced in Baltimore in the libel case uh, run up to April 1st, 1938. So he would have to have been an, a communist and a courier, if the story was true, up until uh, probably mid-April 1938, which is the date he finally fixes upon. Now, I just, I just can't believe um, that a man of his intelligence, because he was intelligent, uh, a man who had lived with this thing and rehearsed it over a period of years and gone over his story again and again, uh, could possibly be an error. It seems to me that the story that he finally told was manufactured to meet the date of the documents that he produced. And if you, uh, if you believe this, then you almost come inevitably to the conclusion that the documents were produced too. I mean, that they were, that they were made to order to, uh, for the two parts of the story to fit. So the more I looked at this, uh, and the more I became convinced that this had been held up as a symbol with which to beat the New Deal uh, of Franklin Roosevelt and the Truman administration and the liberal movement in the country over the head by connecting them all with communism. The documents were supposed to have been typed on an old Woodstock typewriter that belonged to the Hisses. Now there was a great hunt on for this typewriter. FBI agents were scouring the country to, to come up with a machine. Uh, mysteriously enough, they couldn't find it, and mysteriously, Hiss, his own brother, uh, working out of the law office in Washington, finally came up with a machine. Hiss, the defense, produced the machine. No effort was made by the government to, to examine it, to say, well, let our own experts verify whether this is a phony machine or not. And this, again, to me, has the odor of, uh, of a made-up, trumped-up case, a framed case. The part of the documents that had absolutely no trial value at all uh, became the things that, uh, by which the case was known. Uh, Chambers, after he produced the uh, original documents in Baltimore, <coughs> later came up with what were called the pumpkin papers. 
These were not actually papers. They're rolls of microfilm that were hidden in a pumpkin on this Maryland farm. And he took house investigators out and with great uh, glee showed them where he had concealed the second batch of uh, documentary evidence. Uh, the trouble with it was that uh, as far as the trial was concerned, uh, you could not uh, positively identify these papers as having come from the old Hiss Woodstock typewriter because they were just microfilms and that is not detailed enough for any document expert to be able to say that that they were connected with Hiss. But they made marvelous headlines. And the, the, the drama of the thing was a thing that uh, catapulted the case, I think, into headlines across the country and uh, uh, did more maybe than almost anything else to convince a lot of people that Hiss was guilty. Here were the pumpkin papers. Congressman Nixon at the time was uh, on a cruise down. He was going down to the Caribbean, I believe, for a vacation. A word was flashed to him of this amazing new find, and it was a very dramatic story of the Coast Guard flying a plane out to him and rushing back to be on the scene. The pumpkin papers were the things that uh, naturally caught the journalist's eye and made headlines all over the country. My friend, good friend, the late Blair Moody, was correspondent in Washington for the Detroit News at the time. He was a member of the Gridiron Club and asked me as his guest to this one particular dinner but he also asked if I would serve as a sort of uh, surrogate host for him to a young congressman from California, Richard Nixon. Blair was interested in the, uh, participating in the show, the songs and whatnot. My wife and I had met the Nixons before at several dinner parties. I knew that my night's work was cut out for me because they were both uh, rather bashful at the time. They dissolved into the wallpaper at parties and it was impossible to get them to discuss anything. Well, at the dinner, I did my level best, but I was getting no responses from them at all. This, I should say, was a few days after they had discovered the microfilm in a pumpkin. So finally, in desperation, I said, but tell me, Mr. Nixon, why was it necessary to hide the microfilm in a hollowed out pumpkin in Whitaker Chambers' pumpkin patch? He looked at me as though I were out of my mind. And he said, well, great day. You're a newspaper man. You must have seen the big headlines we got out of it. This whole question of newspaper publicity, newspaper headlines, I think, becomes one of the key elements of the Hiss case. In New York, where the trial was being held, uh, most of the papers were uh, very heavily weighted on the conservative side of the thing. And the first trial ended in a um, hung jury. Stories were written about the jurors who had held out and refused to vote for a conviction. They were pictured as somehow suspect people. Uh, Judge Kaufman, who had presided at the first trial, was uh, severely criticized and uh, uh, Nixon himself uh, suggested that maybe uh, an impeachment proceeding should be considered because of the judge's rulings in this case. And so he had to go to trial again in New York in an atmosphere in which, it seems to me, uh, prospective jurors had already been warned of what fate uh, was in store for them unless, uh, <laughs> unless they, they went along with the prosecution's case. I think that this was one of the uh, serious elements in the thing. And then you had the kind of press coverage, uh, especially of the second trial. Uh, Victor Lasky, who was on our paper at the time, had prepared a book uh, called Seeds of Treason, which uh, had adopted completely Whitaker Chambers' story and uh, held that uh, Hiss was, a, in essence, a traitor, a spy, and uh, he was now being tried for perjury simply because the statute of limitations prevented him from being tried for anything more serious. Well, the Lasky was assigned to, to cover the trial. Now, um, Norton Mockridge, who was a rewrite man on the World Telegram at the time, almost went out of his mind 